want to talk about basically a multilateral effort to try and keep fossil fuels underground and particularly the carbon bombs that we were just talking about. Um, and I want to do that in the context of what I'm calling a rising tide of supply side policies. And by supply side policies, I mean policies to try and keep fossil fuels in the ground. So it can be bans, it can be moratoria, it can be phase out policies, it can be removal of fossil fuel subsidies, control on finance for fossil fuels, basically any tool which is essentially trying to limit the extraction and production of fossil fuels. So, okay, next slide. Um, so yeah, basically what I want to do just briefly, um, say a bit about why we, why even think about a new treaty? Because we've already got a climate regime. We've had 30 years of negotiations on climate change. Uh, do we really need another treaty? My answer to that question is yes, and I'll tell you why. Uh, what would that treaty contain? Um, lots of different ideas about what some of the principles, mechanisms, provisions might be. I'll talk you through a few of them. And then just one or two thoughts on how we might get there. So the first thing to note that despite... 30 years now, more than 30 years of negotiations on climate change, we failed to mention the main cause of the problem, which is quite extraordinary <laughs> when you think about it. The fact that even the Paris Agreement and the uh, UNFCC agreements, they don't mention fossil fuels. Um, now, why is that a problem? Because it's obviously the main driver of the climate crisis and because we're faced with what SEI and UNEP call a production gap, which is a gap between planned extraction and production of fossil fuels and the amount of fossil fuels we can afford to extract and burn to be compatible with the goals of the Paris Agreement, namely uh, two degrees or 1.5 uh, in its more aspirational form. So there's this huge gap between what governments are planning to extract and, and what's actually available and would be compatible with safe climate thresholds. Um, and the latest report said that it was about that governments are planning to extract about 110% more fossil fuels than would be compatible with that threshold. So that's the problem. And this fact, as I mentioned already, that the Paris Agreement and other climate agreements do not even mention coal, oil and gas, which, of course, is a result of decades of intense lobbying by the fossil fuel industry to make sure that that is the case. Um, and this was the starting point, really, for a conversation Andrew and I had in a pub in Ballam back in 2018, where we were reflecting on, I think it was the 50th anniversary of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and thinking about how that treaty came about and the ways in which it was organized, which is really around three key pillars. And we started thinking about whether those three key pillars, which I'll describe in a moment, could be translated into dealing with fossil fuels. Um, we thought they could. And, and as the evening went on, we consumed more wonderful IPA in the Ball and Bowling Club. <laughs> we decided we should throw out this proposition and this idea, which we did in this Guardian op-ed that you can see the picture of um, here onto the left of my screen. Um, and quite quickly, this idea caught on. We had positive responses from Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben and the heads of Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace and Caroline Lucas and various, various others saying, yes, this is what we need. This is the right approach. Um, and then quite quickly, um, activists, in particular Zipporah Berman, got in touch with us and said she was keen to launch a global campaign for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which is now in full force. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But then, of course, the conversation turned to, well, what would this treaty do? It's one thing to you know, write a short op-ed saying this is the sort of thing we need and to draw parallels with the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. But what actually would it do? And that's what resulted in that second image you can see there is a paper that we published in uh, Climate Policy going into much more detail about the nature of this treaty and what it could do. So just to sort of cut to the chase, these would be the, this is sort of the read across, if you like, from the nuclear treaty and how it might apply to fossil fuels. So three key pillars, the first one being non-proliferation, which is essentially about let's not make the problem worse. So basically a moratoria or a limit on new expansion of fossil fuels into new frontiers. A second one would be, and obviously this applies largely to richer countries first off and those with most historical responsibility, would be the managed decline of existing investments and infrastructures. To, so roll back of things which are already planned. And a third element would be a just transition pillar, because clearly there's many poorer countries around the world that are still heavily locked into and dependent upon um, oil, gas and coal. Um, that will need financial and technological and other support to transition away from them and to diversify that their economies. And so that pillar is very much around the mechanisms and means by which that would be uh, that would happen. And we describe in that paper 
uh, what that would look like. So just a bit of the, the content very briefly. Um, although this is um, a new treaty, it's very much trying to strengthen the goals uh, and purposes of the Paris Agreement. So it's really trying to limit fossil fuel production with a view to reaching and achieving the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. And it would do it by setting burnable carbon budgets and targets for the phase out of, of particular fossil fuels, which could be would be sequenced according to countries' historical responsibility and, of course, their respective capabilities and ability to, to diversify. And the key underlying principles, therefore, would be around... Which and the principle that's already established in the climate regime, of course, around historical responsibility, common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities, which is a key uh, part of that phrase. Embodying principles around precaution, polluter pays, prevention of harm, all of these are clearly established legal principles. And I've done other work with uh, Harrow Van Asselt, the lawyer, trying to spell out how these could be adopted and refined and included in a fossil fuel treaty. Um, and, you know, countries that you might imagine would be leading on this, and of course, over 13 of them have so far um, lent their support to this, and there's hope that there's more to come. Uh, there may even be further announcements at the upcoming COP in, in Baku, in Azerbaijan. Um, clearly, vulnerable countries have a stake in this, would want to see this, but we have seen a wave of what's called first movers, if you like, uh, countries such as Costa Rica, Denmark, Colombia, um, New Zealand, Chile and others either accelerating phase out of fossil fuels or voluntarily agreeing, uh, agreeing to leave certain reserves in the ground. Um, so clearly there would have to be some principles and sequencing of commitments to, you know, by fossil fuel source and by region and by country. Um, but clearly the focus would be on richer fossil fuel uh, dependent countries. So we're talking you know, what's sometimes called the fossil fueled five, you know, UK, US, Canada, Norway, Australia. These might be the sorts of countries that in a big historical responsibility still have reserves of fossil fuels and certainly in a position to, to diversify away from them. Uh, a much more a tougher challenge, of course, will be the likes of Russia, Saudi Arabia, etc., who you wouldn't expect necessarily to, <laughs> to come on board straight away. Uh, but who over time might be pressured to to join an arrangement um, like this. And of course, it would have to cover the countries with the greatest concentrations of, of carbon bombs that Andrew's already uh, introduced us to. So why would countries want to do this? Why cooperate? Clearly, it would be about trying to close this production gap. And, and frankly, unless we do that, there's no hope of the climate um, negotiations achieving their goals. So this is absolutely essential. It's, it's sort of the, the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, but it's absolutely crucial. And, and, and the mood music on this, I do think, is shifting from IEA and you know the UN Secretary General and many others saying quite clearly there's just no scope for further investments in, in fossil fuels. Uh, and even countries that might be have a material interest in not seeing this happen would probably prefer a more managed and orderly transition away from fossil fuels than the sort of chaotic shifts we're seeing at the moment, which are driven either by crisis and war in Ukraine in the Middle East or wildly fluctuating commodity prices. So there's there's an interest, a collective interest, I would argue, in a, in a sort of multilateral response and a more principle driven uh, arrangements where there are mechanisms and principles to guide the nature of, of responses and for many countries that are very fearful of being en ending up with stranded assets of one sort or, or another so there are various, various ways in which this could come about there are drives now already we have, there is something called this global registry of fossil fuels there's moves towards a world commission on fossil fuels to really establish the groundwork uh, for an agreement of this nature and there's ongoing thinking that we're involved in around what might be effective implementation and compliance mechanisms, what form might a global transition fund, which Andrew and I had proposed to take, could it be um, funded through a carbon tax, might it be the redirection of the 11 million US dollars every single minute still spent on fossil fuel subsidies, for example. So there are many ways in which we can think about generating and redirecting funds away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy and the sort of um, technologies that we're wanting to support. And so just to end, um, I mean, I think the important point is there's real momentum behind this, not just support for the treaty per se, but around it. We're seeing the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. There's the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Um, you are having these unilateral declarations from, from key countries, including ones like Colombia, that are still quite heavily dependent on fossil fuels, saying that they will agree to leave these fossil fuels in the ground. So there's something interesting happen, happening and there's support um, from 
different cities. I mean, you could look at the fossil fuel website for the details about how many hundreds of cities have supported this. It's getting support now, not just from environmental NGOs and the usual suspects, but also trade unions, indigenous peoples groups, health organizations, indeed the World Health Organization itself has backed the treaty. Um, and so there's something exciting happening and it may just be, it's, it sounds like a bold, possibly slightly utopian idea, but on the other hand, uh, we need those sorts of ideas right now. And it may well be um, an idea whose time has come. And there's, you know, clearly a lot of actors now from below and from above that are trying to uh, move this forward such that it may be moving from uh, from slogan to policy. So, yeah, these are just some of the figures. That, and again, you can find more details on the treaty website about the sorts of organizations, actors, individuals um, that are supporting the treaty and recognizing that now is the time uh, to adopt something like this if we are to have any hope of overseeing a multilateral fair phase out of, of fossil fuels. And there, finally, are a few more places where you can find more details about that. So that's my pitch. This will be one way of um, trying to diffuse carbon bombs um, Look forward to your questions and comments later. Thank you. Fantastic, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh